If the last 600 years have taught us anything, it is that popes don't quit. There is no league of retired pontiffs, no Holy Father rest home. It is a job for life, or at least it was, until this morning when over a billion Catholics did a collective double take at the news that Benedict XVI had just given his two weeks notice in Latin. So why now? What does it mean for the church and who could possibly replace him? Here's my co-anchor, Terry Moran. It seemed an ordinary rainy Monday in the Vatican, except maybe for that lightning bolt striking St. Peter's. Dominus vobis cum. Pope Benedict XVI gathered a group of cardinals for a small ceremony, the canonization of three saints. His bombshell came at the end. He spoke in Latin, the ancient language of the church. I have come to the certainty, he said, that my strengths due to an advanced age are no longer suited to an adequate exercise of the papacy. I'm surprised. I'm shocked. Around the world, from ordinary parishioners to Vatican insiders, the reaction was the same. Today's decision by Benedict XVI to resign from the papacy came as a huge surprise to me and I think to everyone in Rome and also to everyone in the Vatican. For almost 600 years, it hadn't happened. For almost 600 years, popes died in office. So with this one stroke, Benedict XVI changed history. No one alive has ever seen anything like that happen. And the dynamics of that, I think, are completely unknown. Abemus papam. Just under eight years ago, he stepped out on that balcony of St. Peter's Basilica, Joseph Ratzinger becoming Benedict XVI, chosen to succeed a titan, John Paul II, who had reigned as pope for 25 years. He had a hard act to follow. He had a very difficult act to follow, but he followed it in his own way. Father James Martin is a Jesuit priest and editor-at-large of that order's magazine, America. If John Paul was the rock star, he's the beloved professor. Benedict was a shy man with a great reputation inside the church, a theologian, a strong advocate for a return to tradition in the face of the modern world. But these were hard years for the Catholic Church and for Benedict. There was the continuing agony in the church of the sex abuse scandals in several countries. Cardinal Timothy Dolan of New York spoke with Diane Sawyer earlier and reflected on the toll of it all. When he speaks about the church, when he speaks about Christian life, they're the most noble, loving, uh, the, the most elevated sentiments you can have. And for him to see the troubles, the, the, the corruption, the scandals that have always afflicted members of the church, that's got away on him. Another scandal hit close to home. His own personal butler stole a trove of his private correspondence and leaked it to the Italian media. But over the years, many of the faithful warmed to this meek, prayerful man. He was uh, an incredible shepherd, and he was uh, just someone I would look to um, uh, as one of the great leaders in our church. And now he is leaving to lead a quiet life in the Vatican. So what next? Is this a moment when the church is on the verge of profound change? A lot of people in the secular world look at the Catholic Church and they say, when are they going to ordain women? When are they going to have uh, priests who don't have to be celibate? When are, when are they going to change on the issue of homosexuality? I think for the next pope, those questions all have the same answer, which is no, no, and no. So I don't think you're going to see much change. Catholic scholar Helen Overe, who has advised the pope on women's issues, sees the challenges ahead in stark terms. I think some of the challenges in the future are similar to what they were in 2005 which is making Catholicism relevant and comprehensible as against modern notions of the nature of, of love, the nature of freedom, the nature of progress. The big question in the immediate future, who's next? In a few short weeks now, as they did nearly eight years ago, the cardinals of the Catholic Church will gather in Rome, enter the Sistine Chapel in formal procession with its magnificent Michelangelo frescoes soaring above them, then take their places, lock the door behind them, and pick the next pope. It is an ancient, highly secretive, carefully structured process, part politics, part prayer, and always the potential for stunning surprises. 
So among the front runners, Cardinal Angelo Scola, Archbishop of Milan, a gentle scholar, well liked, close to Pope Benedict, he'd mark a return of the Italians to the seat of St. Peter. Cardinal Peter Turkson, born in Ghana, would be the first black pope. Think of the interesting picture that an African bishop equally devoted to the churches on sex and marriage, its teaching there, and its teaching on poverty and the dignity of every human being. Think of what a picture that would present. There's also Cardinal Odilo Pedro Scherer, Archbishop of Sao Paulo, Brazil, the largest diocese in the largest Catholic country. He may be the strongest candidate from Latin America. And even New York's affable, ebullient Cardinal Dolan is being mentioned, though many believe a superpower pope from the U.S. is unlikely. And he dismissed the idea with Diane Sawyer. What are the odds of an American, a North American? And you were asked, what about you? Is this ABC Evening News or Comedy Central? What is it? You are great. <laughs> it will be a momentous and mysterious process. Set in motion today by the quiet, historic words of the servant of the servants of God, as they say, a man who simply decided it was time.